March that there'll be televoting. So the public will decide which song is going to go forward to represent us in Jerusalem. He grabbed a star and wouldn't let it go. That's what my next guest said of the great Irish writer Frank O'Connor. And maybe the same could be said of himself. Let's meet him. He's the biographer of Frank O'Connor, fellow Corkman, Mr. Jim McKeown. <laughs> Jim, you're very welcome. <laughs> Frank O'Connor, the man. I don't know too much about him. Read, of course, short stories and so on. What introduced you to Frank O'Connor? Well, he always fascinated me, uh, Pat, even as a, as a young lad. Uh, I felt, as you said, he grabbed a star and just wouldn't let go. You know, he had a terrible childhood, uh, terrible deprivation, poverty, drunken father, and yet against all that, uh, no schooling, four years in school, and he, uh, he was determined to make it, and he eventually ended up uh, like a, a literary great. What age was he when he left school? Twelve years of age. He, um, he was going to Ramon, but he was a bit of a disaster, and um, amazingly, he was quite poor at school, and at twelve years of age, the uh, Christian brothers, they, they kind of invited him to leave. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was the end of his formal schooling. That's Never right, had yeah. any more. That's right. And, I mean, he, he taught himself perfect Irish, German, French, and he could read Russian, which is utterly amazing. So he was a bit of a genius, although unrecognised by the brothers at the time. He was, yeah. But he was a bit of a mother's boy as well, because he, His he, mother was Minnie. Minnie, uh, a yeah. fabulous woman, absolutely fabulous. She was orphaned at seven years of age, and um, she had a dreadful life. But um, he was a, he even he was such a mother's boy. He when he wrote his own uh, first autobiography, he wanted to call it Mother's Boy. And the publishers in America said, look, you know that kind of gives out messages of uh, femininity that you're a sissy. So he said, look, I was a sissy, you know? <laughs> and he admits to it because he was always with his mother when he was young, growing up. And he was given a hard time because he was he was a bit bookish even. Even though he wasn't a genius. He was. And the yeah. lads gave him a hard time. And they the mammy would run in to protect him. Oh, sure, she absolutely. She adored him. Uh, typical Irish mother, I think, you know. And he wore huge uh, glasses. They used to call him uh, um, Mal and uh, Specky Four Eyes. And uh, he was just this, he was a tall, gangling young lad with these big, pronounced spectacles. And uh, all the other kids just mocked yeah. him, you know. Now, you mentioned uh, Big Mick, his father. I mean, how bad was he? Because I know there are differences of opinions in Cork as to whether or not he was as bad as, as Frank O'Connor painted him. Well, he was a big, hard-drinking uh, hard man. He often bo boasted of, of drinking 40 pints in one day. And he often brought home um, at night 12 bottles of stout and a half pint of whiskey for an early morning curer. So, I mean, he was a big, <laughs> tough... Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> amazing, you know. But I think um, uh, Frank O'Connor as a young fella and Big Mick, both of them all their lives were rivals for the affection of Minnie. And uh, I think O'Connor, um, he, in many ways, he hated his father. He um, misunderstood him. Uh, he feared him. And uh, in the end, I think he loved him. Yeah. He loved him. Because there, there are lots of stories about being Big Mickey. Tough, tough man. I mean, once O'Connor was quite young, he was seven, <clears throat> and he was in a room. Big Mick was with his brother Lar, another huge man. And they had an argument, and Big Mick took the poker out of the fire and lashed Lar across the face. And some Men were telling me when they were young, they used to ask Larry where he got the scar, and he said it was in the First World War while he was uh, <laughs> fighting a German, you know? <laughs> yeah. Tough people, yeah, tough people. Tough man. Uh, Minnie herself, um, an extraordinary woman, he took her in her later years to Switzerland. That's right. See, when he was growing up, he was always, he was always, she loved him, um, um, like, as I say, like any, any true Irish mother would. And when she was 86, a year before she died, he brought her off to Switzerland on this holiday, to, just to say, almost, he was doing very well at this time. And as she was resting uh, in the sun, kind of uh, sheltered from the fresh mountain breeze, he was delighted. And he went over and he said, look, uh, well, what do you think of it? And she said, uh, it would be a grand place to hang out the washing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the great yeah. Sophia Switzerland, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. She was a broad-minded woman as well, because um, uh, people who read Frank O'Connor's uh, stories, they don't know maybe too much about his private life. I mean, he was ahead of his time, wasn't he? Well, in many ways. I mean, in the 30s, he was living with, with a married woman in Dublin. And by this time, he was a well-known writer. He was a, a librarian in Baldridge. And he was, um, he was managing director of the Abbey at 33. So um, he was away before his time. But Minnie, when Big Mick died, two days later, she went and lived with her son for the rest of her life. And she was always there in the background, kind of keeping a little maternal eye on him. And um, as I say, she just took it all in and accepted, uh, I mean, for instance, once, 
once um, he went off to England and had a bit of a fling with a woman and um, she was pregnant and now they were wondering, Evelyn his wife invited Joan, the, the, the lady, Mr. Sand the Baby, back to Dublin to, to recuperate. She wasn't well. And uh, they were the wife wondering... invited the mistress and, and Frank O'Connor's baby yeah, to live with them. To live with them. Okay. I mean, that wouldn't be tolerated in California in the 90s. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but they were, they were kind of saying, look, how will we tell Minnie? So they were saying, um, look, uh, it's, it's an old friend, and her husband was killed during the war, and uh, she's coming back to recuperate. But when uh, Joan arrived that day at, in Strand Road, before any kind of awkward introductions had begun, uh, Minnie just took the child in her arms and she looked and she smiled at her son and she said, God, he, he's the image of you. <laughs> no, I mean, she, she, she and knew. That, that she was knew. the end of that. She knew. Um, We've talked about Frank O'Connor leaving school at the age of 12 and yet he's managing director of the Abbey Theatre at 33. Mm. Now, what was it? that enabled him to make that breakthrough from maybe being a no-hoper. I mean, who gave him the leg up? What was, what was the event in his life that changed things for him? In, in what context? In, in, well, I mean, he was a volunteer. <laughs> was, it, was it actually oh. being a volunteer and uh, kind of the, the going into prison, being educated in prison? What was it that actually gave him? Um, I think he was always quite determined. He got very disillusioned with the Civil War and with these kind of um, martyrs, people who wanted to die for Ireland, because I even when he interned, <coughs> no, there was a thousand men there. He was only 19, and he refused to go on hunger strike. One boy against a thousand men. He was a terribly stubborn young man, and he saw a lot of young people being shot by, by their own, so he became very, very, uh, very, very anti-war anti as such. But I think it was A.E. first when he was introduced to George Russell, and then he he gave him his first break and then he became, uh, he became very friendly with Yeats and Yeats had, had great time for O'Connor. But like a fellow without <coughs> any formal education becoming a librarian. That, well, that was unbelievable because he went for an audition with Lennox Robinson who was the, the, the court player, who was the head of the library and he, he got the job. And, um, he got a job in Sligo, his first job, and his mother packed his little suitcase and she put in a... He was actually communicated when he was 19 with all the other Republicans. She put in a, a big holy picture of the Sacred Heart into his case and he set off for Sligo. It just shows the mother's love again when uh, every week O'Connor used to send on, post on his dirty laundry down to Cork. <laughs> and <coughs> it gave Minnie a sense of still having a uh, little boy, as it was. Yeah. And she used to wash it and send it back with a half crown for himself. And, I mean, she starved herself for him. You know? And then he moved on to, on to Wicklow, where there was a, 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 a new library being opened. And no, he, O'Connor, first and foremost, wanted to be a poet. He hadn't written that much at, at this time. He was only barely 21. And uh, very disillusioned, there was nobody coming into his library looking for books on poetry. And one day, this uh, farmer came into the library and he said, um, uh, Could you tell me where I'd get a book on poetry, please? So O'Connor was delighted. Poetry. So he said, over there in the corner is the poetry section. So your man went over and he was looking away for about 10 minutes at all the books and he came back again to O'Connor and he said, look, th there's nothing over there, only a load of books on poems and sayings and all that kind of bloody stuff. So O'Connor said, I, I thought you were looking for a book on poetry. So your man said, no, poetry, he said, chickens, why don't you wait? <laughs> <coughs> 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 As he going out the door, he turned and he said, Shakespeare, me bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse my French, but I mean, can you imagine him going in and, 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 and uh, his cock sick, or sorry, his, his chicken, I've got to rephrase that, his chicken sick and, and there was books on Shakespeare, you know? Yeah. O'Connor was absolutely shattered. Uh, did Frank O'Connor have the same problems with censorship as most of the other, Sean O'Fuelons and all the rest of them at that time? Well, he was even worse, I think. He bucked the system all his life, whereas O'Fuelon kind of played the system, uh, and a lot of people tried to play the system. But O'Connor, I mean, practically everything uh, got special attention think, from the state. Uh, I think it would generally be the, the both governments, but generally the, I think the, the, the Valera government, definitely, and the strings were being pulled by, by John Charles McQuaid. Um, uh, I mean, they were, they were, if you look at them now, they were, they were absolutely, they were censored and banned for absolutely yeah. nothing. And was know? he known around the town as kind of a well-known pagan, a well-known 
Ah, oh, sure, he, he reveled in it. He used to love it, you know. <laughs> I mean, he really gave the uh, the proverbial V sign to the establishment. He was always fighting with with, with the state, the uh, censorship board, um, uh, even eventually the library service. They took they took all his um, what I call his European books. He tried to make it very European and open. And he was away before his time as a librarian because um, he introduced bright children's departments, uh, choirs, um, brought in well-known personalities to tell stories. Uh, way, way, way before his time. Yeah, and um, it's a fantastic biography and a very educational one for, for me, I must say, having read uh, his writing but not known too mm. much about his life. But your own life, um, as people might remember the last time you were on the show, um, is very spectacular as well. You were in, in the postal service. I was, for I was uh, incarcerated for, for 29 years past. I often wonder, <laughs> I often wonder uh, what would have happened if, if I hadn't gone in there, but we'll never know, and maybe, um, you know, we'll never know, but if... Um, you were a man of letters. <laughs> I was definitely death. a man of letters, yeah. you know. Um, it was colourful. Some, I worked with some quite colourful... Yeah, remember the last time you told us about the lads who'd be sorting the mail on a hot summer's night, they'd all be in the nude. They used to take off their clothes, that's right. Yeah. I wonder what Absolutely. Emily would have made of them, fellas, yeah, if she'd yeah. gone in. Yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I know that you've been, you're very busy at the moment. Just tell us what you're up to, because you're a man of many, many parts. Oh, I, I'm, I'm... Actually, it, it kind of all happened after my last visit, but the last three or four months have been just hectic. Uh, I, um, I, uh, I was part in Angela's Ashes. I did not... I was in two films this Which year. You're where? Uh, Second from the right oh God, there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you are, <gasps> yeah. That's you. It's just like the firing squad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And what part do you play in Angela's Ashes? I'm, a, um, I think, typecast. I'm a, I'm a middle-class gentleman, you know. <laughs> I was supposed to be a priest first, you know. Um, uh, I met... Um, for what I met uh, Frank McCourt and I was telling him and he said you have the face of a fat contented Catholic priest <laughs> so I don't know whether it was, a, it was, a, was, a, was an insult or, 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 yeah, or there is or a, a scene in the book where there's a priest uh, going to a sick person on a bicycle That's with right, the, yeah. the Eucharist That's uh, right. under his coat on a bicycle and uh, you know looking at the children the poverty that's like right. staring him in the face and not doing anything. But I, and I would have loved to be a priest. You know, I, I, I do anything for an Isle Island ticket. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but, uh, um, even I, like things have really taken off. I, I, uh, I'm writing a weekly column for a newspaper. I, uh, I got a beautiful job at Ogre uh, Corky teaching um, youth development in Strawberry Hill, which is fantastic. Uh, I was on a radio play last night. Uh, even tonight in a hotel, I met a man and I wrote some scripts and he's looking at them. I have some scripts for RT as well. You might see one of them and give him a kick in the ankle for me, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it does a lot. I've got and you, in, the one-man show. Are you still doing uh, the one-man show? Oh, oh yeah. I, I was in, in Blarney last week. I was in Wexford. Who, who uh, said that it was too good to be a one-man show? <laughs> it should so, bore so, people. Somebody <laughs> said... Yeah. Uh, I, I play, I think, about 22 characters in O'Connor's life, and, and um, it, it's great. It's tough, it's tough, it's strenuous, but um, it, it's fantastic, you yeah. know? And I believe that there is um, at least one section of our audience is a captive audience tonight. <laughs> Oh, that's right. About two weeks ago, I, um, quite an unusual venue. I was in Cork Prison, you know, yeah. and uh, Asher, they were great. And, and uh, they said tonight they got a kind of a dispensation. So tonight you'll have 274 extra viewers. So um, <laughs> they said, would I, would I give away? So lads, um, uh, sleep tight and, and, and be good. <laughs> they don't have much choice where they yeah, are at the yeah, moment. Yeah. Look, Jim, um, I think you're a fantastic man. You're a bit of a renaissance man. And all the more, having abandoned the, the safe, secure job in the Thank post you. office to become uh, much more a man of letters than ever before. My wife still thinks I'm a lunatic. You know, <laughs> she might be far wrong. No. Jim McKeown, <laughs> thank you very much for being here this morning. Thank you. Stay here. Yeah, you can just relax there and we finish yeah. the show. Okay. Okay. Yeah.